So my point is that the outlook of this Republican Party that emerges as a northern party in the 1850s is an outgrowth of this expanding small-scale capitalist society, a society of, as I say, small farmers, a city, an urban and small town middle class, a society in which it does still seem possible to work one's way up from wage earner to independent producer. And if there's one takeaway from my first book, it was this simple point. Anti-slavery was not just a negative attitude, not, a, not just a negative outlook. It was an affirmation of the superiority of the northern form of social organization to that of the South. Republicans called themselves over and over and over again the party of free labor. Free labor, a society based on free labor as opposed to a society obviously based on slave labor. Why was free labor society superior, so to speak? Um, well, their argument was it was because it offers the opportunity for social advancement. It offers people the opportunity to improve their condition in life, to work their way up into this status of independent uh, producer. Um, Northern society allowed people a chance to rise. The New York Times says, our paupers of today, thanks to free labor, are the yeomen, that is the farmers, and merchants of tomorrow. Now the goal of mobility was not necessarily giant wealth, although naturally people would be happy with that, but as I say, economic independence is the goal. Owning your own farm, owning your own shop, your, 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 or owning your own artisan craft uh, establishment. Now of course this ideal does not, uh, does not originate in the 1850s, it goes back to the American Revolution or even before, it goes back to what some historians call the uh, idea of artisan republicanism. The notion of a society, a republic based on small producers. People, why? Because those people, the argument is, goes, um, have eco enjoy economic independence. A republic, a government resting on the will of the people should should have a population that enjoys economic independence. Jefferson said the same thing, of course, in an agrarian mode. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. Jefferson's not just talking about labor, he's talking about politics. He's talking about how a, society, how a political system is organized. What kind of population do you need to have a representative democracy function? It can't function in a European situation, they say, with a large, impoverished working class, a significant, privileged aristocracy. Then there's no way, that, that's not the social system on which political democracy can flourish. So this is, we're talking about the economy, but also the polity at the same time. The small producer is the backbone of society, according to this, this ideal. Now, the small producer, fortunately enough, the free laborer is also the most economically efficient, according to this argument. This goes back to Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. If you have read that part of The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, you will know that Smith argues very explicitly that free labor is more efficient than slave labor. A society based on free labor will develop economically more effectively than a society based on slave labor. Why? Smith is not doing a statistical analysis of output and productivity. It's an ideological argument. It's not about measuring. It's, it's an intellectual argument. And the argument is that in a free labor society, the worker has an incentive to labor because the worker benefits from his own labor. He can accumulate, he can rise in the social scale. In a slave society, the worker has no incentive. The slave has no incentive to work hard or well. In fact, the slave has the opposite incentive. The slave has an incentive to do as little work as he possibly can because he does not benefit from his work and um, in fact, uh, and he cannot rise in the social scale. So therefore, Enjoying some of the fruits of your own labor is essential, says Smith, to 
to economic growth, economic development. Now, of course, there are many people who argue today that this is not really true, that slave, the slave South was very economically productive and, and, and wealthy. But this ideological argument of the superiority of free, of free labor, on an eco not on a moral ground here, but on an economic ground, is very widely shared um, in the North. Um, so, and of course, as I said before, it also goes along with the notion that, that free labor a free labor society promotes the idea of the dignity of labor. That in the South, um, labor is considered degraded, as I say. Now, here I have to admit I differ a little bit with Ashworth, but you can decide for yourself what you think of that in his book, because Ashworth argues that um, wage labor is widely accepted as legitimate in the North in the 1850s. Uh, that, that the contrast between slavery and free labor is wage labor on one hand and, and slave labor on the other. Whereas I argued more that wage labor is, is itself considered degrading and that the idea is wage labor is a temporary status for young people, let us say, but that the real ambition is to become independent. That if you are working for wages your, own, your whole life, you are not you're not really free. In fact, the labor movement at this time uses the phrase wage slavery. Wage slavery to, defi to define the condition of, of wage laborers on the grounds that if you are dependent on someone else for your wage, you are not truly free. Um, now, the anti-slavery movement rejects that, of course, because the wage, <laughs> wage labor, they insist, is not a slave. Slavery is a uniquely oppressive system, and to compare it with northern uh, factory or other conditions is inappropriate, but nonetheless, to my mind, the goal ultimately is economic independence. But be that as it may, it doesn't really matter. The key point is that the North offers, ideologically, it said, economic opportunity, which the South does not, which a slave society does not, does not offer.